With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Oh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Thank you so much for giving us the most precious thing you have, your time, as we continue to do what we always try to do, turn down the noise of the news cycle, get to the things that really matter and the information we need to discern the times we live in. And then that way we don't just react to everything all the time or get caught up in stuff. We can kind of figure out what's going on in our place in it all. There's a debate going on over in the UK that happens here in the States from time to time about uh, national service. Now, in the larger context, uh, there's a prime minister uh, general election going on over there. They're getting ready to pick a new leader. We've talked about it on the program recently. We're going to talk about it again today with Alex Petropoulos, um, one of our great UK contributors, because I, I've had him on the show before. He's a great writer, really good guy, has a vast background of living abroad, not just in the UK, but grew up in Greece. He now lives in Belgium. But he did an interview on Sky News, and I saw this interview, and it really brought this national service debate into focus in a couple of ways because he was the young guy. They brought on a middle-aged guy, and they debated this on Sky News, and kind of the presenter and the guy that were kind of ganging up on Alex a little bit, but he held his own. We're going to link to it, hertel.substack.com, uh, or in the show notes on everything but iTunes because iTunes doesn't let us link to anything for some reason. I digress. Alex was talking to this older guy, and the older guy, let's just be honest, he's more my age, my generation, right? And Alex was the younger generation, and Alex was against it, and that guy was for it. And the gentleman, I'm not picking on him because a lot of people hold this view, and I can understand how he came to this viewpoint. His viewpoint was, well, we need to make, I'm paraphrasing here, we just make these young people serve their country, and that's going to give the country something, and that gives these young people something, and da 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 and then he drew from his own experience of being both active duty and a reservist. The reservist system is a little different in the UK, but you get the idea. And he talks about, you know, the house I live in is because of this. And I got this and I got that and that. Time out. National service is a great thing. National service is an honorable thing. It's a noble thing to serve your country, serve something bigger than you. The problem here in the debate we need to have about national service is exactly why it brought my eyebrows up when Rishi Sunak, who's in the process of losing his premiership in the UK, brings it up. It's the same reaction I have when people in the United States bring it up. Too often, it is pulled out by the older generations or by a desperate politician as just this kind of shirt to wave at the young people, for not for their benefit, but for older voters to go, if we just make these darn youths do something, it'll all be better. That's kind of how this boils down a lot of the times. Now, they put a lot of flowery language around it. They talk about patriotism and service and all that, but mandatory national service doesn't create patriotism. You cannot artificially create patriotism. You can't do it. I'm about as patriotic as anybody can possibly be. You can't make somebody be patriotic. It's an idiotic notion, and we should stop saying it in any of those terms. Making them stand for the Pledge of Allegiance does not make them patriotic. It makes them obedient. Making them listen to the national anthem does not make them patriotic. It makes them obedient. Patriotism is something inside you. However, I do think there's a lot of benefits to national service. My problem and Alex's problem and the problem this gentleman couldn't seem to get his head around it over is the compulsory part. There is a generation gap in politics, whether it's the UK or the US. We are in the midst of generational change. The boomer generation, uh, we're coming off the D-Day celebration right here. We're the greatest generation, the 80th anniversary. It's the last time we'll probably have living veterans at a major anniversary like that because they're almost all gone. They're all over 100 years old or over. Now, I think the oldest one there is like 107. You know, they're almost gone. The boomer generation is the next generation that's going to go into history because time and tides wait for no man. Everybody dies. None of us are getting out of this thing alive. Generations change. And the boomers are passing on. My parents are both baby boomers, and they're in their mid to late 70s now. Time just keeps marching. So the baby boomer generation that has had a lot of the political power in America is starting to pass off the scene. And Generation X, Generation Z, the millennials, the Zoomers that are coming after them, whatever you want to call these cohorts, they're growing. 
And a lot of them have a lot of different things about it. Because remember, the middle-aged people in America now are the end of Generation X and the bulk cohort of the millennials. They're starting to enter into their late 30s, early 40s, mid 40s now. I'm kind of the last of Generation X. You know, I'm 44. First, last of Gen X, first of the millennials, whatever you want to call it. But my parents were boomers and I didn't have internet growing up. So I don't fit as a millennial. Sorry, I just don't. These generational changes matter. But then this old trope of, well, young people just need to serve their country and it'll fix all their problems doesn't go away. Let me use myself as an example, though. I'm all for national service, which is not compulsory. I joined the military when I was 19 years old. I was 20 by the time I actually went in. I had already enlisted. I did a delayed enlistment. But I was one of those listless youths that people keep going on and on about and worry about, especially young men, because we have demographic information that we know that 18 to 25-year-old men who don't get involved in something or don't go to school or don't get a trade or so on and so forth have problems in society. That's a non-debatable point. Will national service fix that? Well, maybe. Let me use myself as the example again. I was that listless 20-year-old, 19-year-old. I was working at Walmart in my hometown because I'd failed out of college. I was living in mom and dad's basement. I did all that, and I made a move, and I went to the recruiter, and I changed my life. I got a lot of benefits from that, though. My education was paid for. I got to go back to college and finish up college-level coursework. I got to travel the world. I got skill sets that led to my career after the military. I got a lot of benefits from that. I can honestly say, like the gentleman on that Sky interview with Alex said, my lifestyle today was built on a foundation of my national service as an active duty member of the military for over 12 years. That's all true, but I decided to do that. There was also bad with that. We'll talk about some other time, and I talked with Alex about it, but I want to keep it on the good parts. But, you know, I'm a frequent VA patient for a reason. There was stuff that happened, right? But that was something I decided to do. I did a cost-benefit analysis and said, this is better than the situation I'm in. It will give me things. It also cost me things. So here's the thing with this national service debate, though, is if you're just making people do it for the sake of doing it, you're not getting those young people to think any better of their nation or their government or anybody else. You're just making them do it. Now, can you have national service that is incentivized? Now you're on to something. Do you trade them civil service or community service or military service for things like education or other benefits? Now you're on to something because now they're going, I'm getting something from this, and that does build up stuff. A couple of the tropes we get dig into with Alex is the political side of this, how politicians that are older, and by the way, and I'm just going to call it for what it is, somebody like Richie Sunak, who's one of the richest men in the UK, who was educated in America. I always, almost without exceptions, find it amazing that the people calling for national service are people that have never actually done any national service. Hello? Anywho, we get into it with Alex, this trope of older politicians just waving the shirt that the youth will be fixed if we just make them do certain things isn't true. You got to incentivize them. You're going to end up with these generation of people that have gone through housing crises and COVID and having trouble getting into the careers they want and all this sort of thing. And let's call it something else we cover a lot. People that go through the higher education system, spend a lot of money on it and don't have degrees and skill sets that are applicable to the job system that is as it exists in the world, not as it was pitched to them as pipeline students. And they get frustrated. Frustrated young people cause problems in countries. Making them do things isn't going to make them less frustrated. You have to incentivize things. But one of the oldest things in all of politics is politics is set up for the powerful that have the money. And that is disproportionately the older folks and things like welfare systems, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, welfare here in America or like the NHS over in England. Older people are living off the benefits of younger people's works. That's just the reality how this works. So compulsory service doesn't help those issues. What we need to do is start figuring out ways to incentivize and reward people that are young who make decisions to serve their country, to get into jobs, make things easier for them. So we talk about that a little bit. We also get into politics. Since the last time we checked on UK politics, uh, the general election has been called. We're going to talk about a little bit about Keir Starmer and Labour trying to get the reins of power after 14 years. We're going to talk about Richie Sunak and the sinking ship of the Conservative Party over there. Also get a little bit into some of the reform party. So Nigel Farage has decided he's going to run again. We'll talk about that. Alex Petropoulos is a great friend of the program, really sharp guy. 
This national service debate is an important thing to talk about, plus UK politics. One of those things we love to do on here, we don't just myopically chase the trends and think about it. We need a wider perspective. So we go over to UK, see what's going on. And as I told Alex, our own election is a hot mess. So it's kind of nice to pick on somebody else and make fun of them a little bit. So national service, UK politics, Alex Petropolis, all that on her tell right after this. Ah, welcome back to her tell. Okay, we haven't talked to Alex in a while, but we are thrilled to get him back. He's you, I need a flow chart for this, buddy. You're born in England, have the English accent, but you grew up in Greece and now you're in Brussels. You're all over the place, my friend. Alex Petropoulos, how are you, sir? I'm doing very, very well. You, you don't need your flow chart. You, you got it well there. Born in England, grew up in Greece, studied in England, moved back to Greece, and now in Brussels. Yeah, I'm yeah. doing great. It's, it's great to be back on the show. A man of the world. Awesome to talk to you. He does a lot of uh, policy stuff, a lot of AI stuff. We're going to talk about something else because, buddy, I caught you. You were on Sky News doing an interview, and it actually kind of got my back up a little bit. I want to talk about this national service thing. We'll talk UK politics in a minute. But one of the things, Rishi Sunak, who has a very steep hill to climb to hold on to his premiership, most people think he's going to lose it for a lot of reasons, not all his fault. Some are his fault. We'll talk about the politics in a minute, but he did what I've heard a lot of politicians do in the UK. I've heard them do it in the US. Other countries, they do this. One of the things he pulled out of the rhetorical bag was to promote national service, either military service, civil service, et cetera. I've heard this a lot over the years. I hear it here. I hear it there. I don't like it. Um, And I'll lay, let me, let's do this. Let me lay a couple biases on the table. Okay. Mm -hmm. I did serve in the military voluntarily. We have voluntary military in the U.S. I went and I did military service. You did that interview with a guy, and the guy you had the interview with was closer to me than you because I'm a lot older than you. So I understand the argument. I have the lifestyle I have now because of that military background because of the skills I got, paid for my education, things like that. Also caused some medical stuff that's been a problem, but let's stick to the positive stuff. I get the argument that it serves you. But I don't like this idea that we just pull it out of the bag and do a compulsory with nothing else. And I think you made the point, you're younger than me, you're one of those younger generations, like the compulsory point just for the political points for an older generation, that rubbed you wrong. And it was for not just that, but because it kind of goes to the heart of a lot of the political problems and this generation gap we're seeing in UK politics. That was your take on it, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I think you, you're spot on. Like the the compulsory part is the is the bit that that really just it it turns it from a okay, let's have a conversation about this. I can see the pros, I can see the cons. We can have a nice debate, and you can say, I, I'll maybe have some of my friends who'd say I'd do that, and some of my friends who say no, I'd never do that. And you say, okay, nice, but but then you're saying compulsory. We're, we're not even having that debate. We're saying we're you know there's some of the young people who might want to do this. Some young people who will hate doing this. Who's going to ruin their their plans and you're just throwing all that out the window i, I you're right it, there there are links to the to the broader the broader aspect and and without touching on po- politics too much yet it, it does just seem to be just this throwing away any prospect of of winning a, a youth vote all just for like the this older bo- boomer vote is what what people my age would call it i don't know if that's quite accurate with the age demographics, but but the boomer vote in general. Yeah, we have the same problem here. Look, it's built into the system. Older people, more money, more influence, more experience. Mm-hmm. They've been around a lot longer. Politics is always going to be, you know, especially when you get into things like welfare states, you're dealing with it with the NHS over there. We deal with it with things like Medicare, Medicare over here. Look, the young working class is going to pay to take care of the elderly class. You can call it whatever you want. That's what it is. That's just reality. But then when you start getting into things like housing crises, job crises, I've had a lot of the UK friends that we work with and they're just like, look, you're one of them. You're not you're an expat now. You're in Brussels like, hey, I got to go somewhere else to work at least for a few years and then maybe I can come back. 
it just rubs the wrong way of, and this is where I say, I think compulsory is the wrong idea. If you want to pitch this, incentivize it. Okay, well, it's, I know it's a different system in the UK, but mm. for the US, like, okay, do national service, either civil and or military, and you get educational benefits, or you get a leg up on federal jobs, or you get whatever, you know, incentivize the compulsion for compulsion's sake is where I just think it's a talking point. And I frankly find it to be a bit of an insulting one. Yeah, insulting is definitely a word I'd use as well. Uh, this idea that young people, like you say, are, are sort of, I have conversations with my friends in the UK, and they say that if if Rishi won the election, I genuinely, genuinely consider just moving, just leaving. Because at that point, I wouldn't see a path forward for myself as a country. Not myself, I'm talking on behalf of my friends, but my friends wouldn't see a path forward for themselves in the country, for them to actually be able to buy a house, for them to be able to live and prosper and build a livelihood, build the lives that their parents and their grandparents did actually succeed. You know, we're seeing for the first time a generation that is looking like it will have lower average wages than the parents' generation. That That's breaking the social contract. For the longest time, it has been the deal that, okay, where the younger generation is going to pay for the older generations, but we're also going to have a, a bit of a better time. We're going to have slightly higher wages. We're going to have slightly better services. We're going to have an easier time at the very least. And that's now no longer the case. And so it it does seem to be the case that more and more has sort of just been thrown on and less and less is being given in return. And, you know, there has to be this given this take, like you say, we have to do our part to, to create a functioning society where everyone chips in their bit. But that means us, like young people, getting something in return as well, which in the UK, it's been few and far between. Yeah, Alex Petropoulos joining us. There's a practical side of this that I don't like the argument. Look, I, I was in the military active duty for over 12 years before I couldn't do it anymore. A one year of military service is not very helpful to the military because, you know, you're going to spend two, th you know, eight to 12 weeks in basic training. It's going to take you two to three months to learn whatever your skill set for your career field or job classification is. You're really only going to get about four or five months of service out of somebody. And that's an extreme amount of investment mm -hmm. into somebody from the military's point of view that they're not going to keep. And I understand they'll go into a reserve kind of thing you can pull, but that's a different thing. Practically speaking, I don't like that. And the UK has a recruitment crisis and the US has a recruitment crisis and recruiting, recruiting crises are not um, magic and they're not a mystery when the economy's good. And I know inflation's high, but the unemployment's really, really low. Usually unemployment and recruiting mm. go hand in hand. And we're coming off where foreign policy is a mess. We're coming off a long stage of, you know, foreign wars, whatever you think of them that has bittered people and they don't trust their governments with the military going overseas right now, some for good reason, some for bad reason, but that just is what it is. Those are the two factors that affect it. Neither one of those things is going to help military recruitment. If you start doing compulsory where you get people that don't really want to be there, or they're only going to be there for a cup of coffee and leave. This seems like another example of a rhetorical policy that would actually have really bad ripple effects. And I know it because I've done training in the military. Like, hey, if you don't have somebody that's invested, if you're going to keep a couple of years, you're not doing the military any good. You're not doing the country any good. Frankly, you're not doing that individual any good because they're not going to get the benefits of service anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, this is actually a, an example where my, my Greek background actually gives me some insight because Greece has mandatory national service, meaning so all men. Uh, over the age of 18 have to spend, currently have to spend a year in the armed forces uh, for training. The main reason the government will say you do that is because of, they're, they're afraid of Turkey, they want to boost the defenses. But in practice, what that looks like is you do your basic training, you learn all that, and then you spend the remainder of those 12 months just standing around, just standing, raking leaves maybe, peeling potatoes maybe, but, but you're not actually contributing, you're not learning anything, you're just standing. You're just literally just standing about waiting for the time to pass, you're being a drain on the public finances because you are being paid to do that, but at the same time, not realistically making the country more secure and stronger, not realistically benefiting yourself and, and learning things that you can take with you somewhere else. So it, it really just is seen as a lose-lose and seen by a lot of my Greek friends as a, a waste of time. They, they try to avoid uh, at all costs. 
And I think that I wouldn't be surprised if a UK version of this looked similarly, if it was, you know, haphazardly organized, they sort of say, ah, oh, we're going to do national service. Ah, this will be great. Put them in the army. That that doesn't inspire confidence. And like you say, you have to really look, approach this from a, from a very strategic point of view. We say, okay, what are the sort of people we want to be trying to bring into the military? How do we get them? How do we make it an, an attractive institution for them? <laughs> This is com the, the complete other end of the, the spectrum is what we're going for, which is, oh, just throw them all in and, and it'll fix the problem. Yeah, and I, and this goes back to, you know, from my own experience a little bit, you're going to end up with a caste system military where those folks, there's going to be a whole section of the military just designed to shuffle those folks and pipeline them through and get them out that's completely separate from everything else going on because the military is going to see it as a waste of their time because it's mostly mm -hmm. a waste of their time. Even if you do end up retaining two, three, four, five percent, it's going to be a low number. That one of the things that came up in that interview you did with Sky News, we're going to link to it in the show stack notes. Watch the whole thing. Alex did a really good job on that, even though you're getting ganged up on by both of them, I felt in a little bit. Um, one thing they they did what they always do the and I don't want to call the gentleman out because he's this is a very mainstream view he has I'm not picking on him here he's just representative of it he brings up the other countries you mentioned Greece has compulsory mm. national service he brought up the Nordic countries I don't know why we always go to the Nordic countries for health care and systems here, here's my problem with that Greece is like 10 million people most of the mm. Nordic countries are six million eight million nine million um, populations. The UK is 66 million people and much, much more diverse than the Nordic countries, which are very homogenous and very mm. culturally um, adapt. The US is 330 million and extremely diverse. Mm. When you're talking about national service and military service and compulsory service, it's a different beast. Look, things that are different are not the same. When you're a very small country with a very small population relatively, and all the population is very demographically the same, nationalistically the same, that's a different beast than a diversified and people go, well, it'll make them that. No, it won't. There's no data on that. Mm -hmm. And I think you'd be better off pushing an incentivized military service and an incentivized civil service. You know, the UK and the US both have major immigration issues right now. Maybe you loop some civil service into that. You street one thing that drives me nuts in the US is just because you do military service, you don't you still got to get in the back of the line for immigration. That's ridiculous. Mm. Certain country, you know, things like this, and I'm just spitballing it, start incentivizing things for these bigger countries like the UK, like the US, which is multitudes bigger, and start having some incentivization instead of just pointing to these other countries and going, well, why don't we do it like that? And it's like, well, because we're not Denmark. We love Denmark. UK ain't Denmark. Very different thing. <laughs> no. UK and Denmark is a very, very well put. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, there's so many different ways that, that these countries differ. You know, the, like the, the Greece and the South Korea example, I think, the, and the Finland example, those are like small countries that are next to really big, aggressive countries. The UK is not that. The Nordic example, is these are these are Scandinavian countries, maybe that have really high tax burdens and, like you say, very homogenous. The UK isn't that and you know within the uk what, what it means to be british is very different in one part of the country to the other part of the country and i don't think that's necessarily a, a bad thing um and i think that you know if you want to try and create this national sense of identity good good but like i said the, the data doesn't show that in fact there's some data that shows that the last round of people who did national service this was like 60 years ago the people who ended up doing this they had less confidence in national institutions after doing it than the people who didn't. National service actually made them less enthusiastic about the British government, about these great national institutions. And so uh, even at that argument, the, the, the base fundamental level that everyone is saying we should do this for, it, it falls apart. Yeah, I, I will assure you from experience that nothing will change your view of bureaucracy as being part of that bureaucracy. And the mm -hmm. military is a bureaucracy. It's just, a, you know, you have your uniforms and other things, but it's still part of the government bureaucracy.
Alex Petropoulos joining us. I, I think there's really something, I think you're on to it when you were talking about how this is indicative of the youth gap that we're currently seeing. Well, you, the U.S. has this problem too, but especially in the U.K., we've been covering this for a couple of years now. Things like the NHS, which is just gobbling up everything that's going on in the country. It's a fact of life. You can rail against it, but there needs to be reforms and it needs to have some conversation about it. And it's almost like it's this mm. untouchable. I think it's a little, you know, people are joking about it. It's the true religion of England. I think that's a mm. little over the top, but you get the idea. The youth vote and the gap as this new generation is rising up and you pick whatever cohort you want, you know, Zoomers, whatever you want to talk about. Let's let's just say the under 30 and rising, because that's really the group we're talking about. Mm. This is the group that things like the national service thing, when you tell them that they recoil to it. But it's not just the national service thing. And you've already touched on a little bit, but just articulate it for folks is like, hey, all these other problems. And that's the one you're going to throw. That's the log you want to throw on this fire, not fixing housing, not working on job creation, not working on, you know, the industrial changes in the Midlands, not working on, you know, the immigration problem in the cities. That's the one they throw on because it's just a buzzword. Is it more than just rhetoric? How do you start talking to the younger voters? And these younger voters are now adults with kids. They're adults with careers. This is going to be the new generation in government in the next 10 years. How do you change the conversation from that boomer speak? I know that's an unfair characterization, but everybody knows what I'm saying when I say that. How do you change that conversation to something more productive of, okay, yeah, we have new ideas and no, we don't want it the way it works, but can you at least give us a hearing on some of this? Yeah, I think that that to summarize what we said, my generation and then the generation just about me's response to hearing national service was very much just a come on, really? Like, we, we've been crying out about the problems that have actually been affecting us, and this is your response. But to answer your question of, of how you actually talk to the, to, to the youth, I think the UK is a really interesting case study here because across America and other Western countries, you've actually seen that, that youth has been shifting a bit rightwards. And this has been a, a response to maybe some of the, the problems that we've been facing not being addressed. And, and a lot of them especially in the Anglosphere, like housing prices come from maybe more too uh, restrictive uh, controls on the market, not allowing the market to build enough housing, and a feeling that like the economy is failing for young people. But in the UK, the youth vote as a whole hasn't shifted right. It hasn't gone towards the Conservative Party because of how crap the Conservative Party has been at delivering to young voters. And, And in fact, what you've actually seen is, is not the case that young voters don't care about things like immigration. You've seen a lot of young voters actually now swap over to say like Nigel Farage's Reform Party because they're actually speaking to them and they're saying, look, this is an issue we see you caring about. We're going to tell you how it is. We're going to actually promise a solution. I think that uh, UK politics has got to this point where it's got beyond uh, young people are fed up enough that they won't actually listen even to what what the Conservative Party would have to say. They're they're, they're done. They're, they're they're finished. There's no. They couldn't announce anything today that would change, in my opinion, a young person's mind about who who decided who they were going to vote for. It will have to take a, a whole generation to change that. That be, even the alternatives though aren't exciting a lot of young people. There 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 aren't many options that are getting people to say, wow, this is really what I feel is calling out to me. And that's indicative of the fact that nothing has been working for young people for so long. So to, to really summarize that for you, the only way we can actually change the way we talk to young people is to actually just deliver something to them, give something to them, show them something that will actually improve their lives meaningfully, and then they'll start listening. Yeah. And Rishi Sunak backpacking on the overnight train is not that thing, right? Just to be clear. Uh, I'm a big fan of trains, so so don't take this as anti-train sentiment. But uh, him him being on a train is definitely not the thing that we need. It's about results. Young people have stopped listening to anything that politi- that, that, that the Conservative Party is telling them. And in order to start listening again, they will have to see results. 
Yeah, Alex Petropoulos joining us. The, this is a good way to get into the UK election that's coming up, though, because earlier I said some of this is Sunak's fault, some of it's not. Let's start with what's not his fault. You just mentioned it. The folks that are 20 years, you know, your cohort, 20 to 25, the conservatives have been in power for the American audience, Canadian audience. Basically, your entire living memory, the conservatives have been mm. in power for 14 years. There's just inertia involved here. We've been talking about it for two or three years in the UK. Like, look, it's just inertia. You can't stay on top forever. It's going to stop at some point. Mm. And we've talked about it before. Brexit kind of gave them an artificial extension on what would have been their normal cycle of being in power. So they got some extra. And then you got the Boris stuff. You got that real mm. outlier election where they got this massive majority. And you see what happened. They didn't know what to do with it. It fell apart really quickly, and now it's a mess. That's a good way to explain to the international audience the basic core of this election, right? Because you just expressed it. They've tuned out the Conservative Party, the Tories, whatever you want to call them, but they've just heard it literally. If you're 24, 25 years, you've heard it your entire life. So that's all you know. So you want to just go, well, let's just give the other guy a chance. A lot of politics just breaks down to that. We talk about partisanships and policy and stuff. That's just kind of the reality of this election. And now they've called the general election to kind of just get it over with, I feel like. Mm. Isn't that the best way to explain this in basic terms? Yeah, there's Keir Starmer and the politics and the policies. That's really what's going on here, though, right? I, I think at a base level it is, you know, I, it's useful to remember that when having conversations like these, that most people who vote aren't like me, won't spend all day like browsing Twitter, reading all the different manifestos, reading the policies, really saying, oh, well, they did this, they did that. Oh, well, if you compare this to this. No, uh, people just look at look at what's in front of them. They look at the life and uh, the quality of life they've been giving it. 14 years is the amount of time that the conservatives have been in, in power. That is... <laughs> To put that into context, they came into power when I was nine years old. Uh, so, and they have been in power ever since. So, so I don't really see how, how you can, you know, that, that, that carries through. Uh, and one interesting aspect of that is the sort of parents' this message is the Labour Party and their messaging and, and their, their slogan for the election is just one word, which is change. And I think that really succinctly summarizes what they think the British public want to hear, which is, you know, we want something different. It's it's about time. You have voters who voted for the Conservative Party in the last election who are now saying, yeah, I voted for them, but we need something else now. Metropolis joining us. I joke in U.S. politics that the biggest thing, in, and I stole this from my dad from years ago, mm. so credit to my father on this, but he told me years ago, and the older I get, the more true it is, he's like, U.S. presidential elections come down to who people want to see on TV every day. Mm. That's like the biggest, like you can talk about politics. I don't know if the U.K. is that bad, but you talked about change. You talked about people wanting a change. There's, there was a lot of chaos, especially the, you know, you do the Boris Liz Trust and that sort of thing. To his credit, Rishi's at least been steady at the, he's had a lot of fobbles, you know, vocally, but there hasn't been chaos and scandal at least. So you can mm -hmm. give him that much. When they look at Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, I'm not a subject, so I don't have to do that. Um, <laughs> with all due respect to the man, you know, they probably hear steady. He sounds like a normal politician. He sounds safe enough. Probably not super exciting, though. I've asked our other UK contributors about this, and they all kind of give me a different answer. So I'm curious. Yours is like they want change. And all due respect to Keir Starmer, there's not a lot of institutional change he's going to be able to deliver, especially depending on how big this majority is going to be. And, and now he's got a little bit of infighting that's kind of questioning that. You're going to have the reform stuff that's going to bleed some votes. So we don't know how big this majority is going to be, but just institutionally, he's there's not going to be big sweeping change after this election. Even though you know UK you usually give your prime minister one or two parliaments, you, you know they're not going to throw them out in two years. Is that a factor here too? Is like okay, we want change. Change is a great slogan. 
but kind of deep down, people know there's not going to be big sweeping change coming, even if they change out the government, right? Yeah, and I think that the British public are expecting things to get better a lot quicker than they actually will. Like they'll they'll give Starmer a bit of time to fix things, and then they'll see things won't fix themselves, and then they'll be like, "Hey, bro, what is this?" And and that's just the reality of how bad things have gotten, how so many of the problems have gone ignored for so long that you need to actually really almost rip a few things out and replace them. Now, I like if you want my personal take on this. I like align quite strongly with where Starmer has placed himself politically, and I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful. I want him to make systemic, large form reforms. I want him to make those big changes, and he's been teetering back and forth of him saying one positive thing that hints that he might do that, and then also not. And it's really it's in the air whether or not he will be this sort of government that comes in and. Just sort of tries to stabilize things, or government that comes in and really tries to shake things up, do the actual massive reforms that are necessary in order to put things back on track. We've had some polling come out even over the past couple of days that hint towards what would be a, a monumental landslide victory from him. I think in those scenarios where you see these 400, 450 seat election wins in a parliament that only has 650 seats in total. These are approaching supermajority sizes. In those scenarios, you could see this sort of real large scale reform. It, it, like I said, it comes down to what the minutia of the election results are. Yeah, Alex Petropoulos joining us. Okay, we, we are bad at this when we're doing talking heading like we're doing now. We're like, well, it's going to be an election about the economy or it's going to be the election about immigration. Well, that's nice, except those are really big terms that cover, you know, you've got a you've got a lot of economic background that covers mm. a real wide swath of stuff. There's different economics. There's personal economics, housing, food prices, mm. jobs. Those are the, the normal people. That's the economics they care about. They don't really care about, you know, things like GDP and inflation rates. They care about gas prices, food prices. Do I have a job? Is my job paying me? Mm -hmm. enough to live? That's how those people live. The UK has got a, a bit of an how do you good uk term little wonky economy right now like you know some some of the us has got this too so i'm not picking on you know some of the fundamentals are pretty good but there's some problems going on there's been a reset there's some debate about whether there's an actual recession or not um give us the economic landscape in practical everyday terms for you know whatever the average voter in the uk is because we hear the terms we hear the dirt how are people actually feeling, though? And we, we're guilty of it, too. We did, oh, well, housing crisis. Well, that doesn't really tell you what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. Give folks the ground because, you know, the economy is going to be a huge part of not so much the election because we know there's going to be a massive win for labor here. But how they affect the economy going forward is definitely going to be like, do they keep their majority? Are they going to have a mandate going forward? How much of a rope do they get? That's all based on pretty much how the economy does, right? Yeah. So... Inflation, people are still feeling inflation and they still feel like their real wages have gone down in comparison to how prices have gone up. And to be honest, they sort of have gone down in relation to how prices have gone up. More importantly, we've sort of just seen stagnation, no growth. And so that's come alongside more spending. And so what you're going to see over the next few years is, is they're going to have to raise taxes. Everyone's saying we won't raise taxes. The problems are too big. They're too systemic. If they're a serious government, they will have to raise taxes in order to fix the problems. They've been put in that situation by the, the conservatives. That will hurt people. I think that the British public don't realize quite the fact that things are going to get a bit worse before they get better. So people are going to have to have have spending sort of cut a bit or else see meaningful shrinking of, of certain services housing prices wise in the core cities where people want to get the jobs london cambridge oxford they're eye-wateringly high the house price they, they've the point is that we keep talking about this crisis and it's easy to think like when we say oh housing crisis housing crisis each year the problem is the same problem each year. It's getting worse each year. The UK is underbuilding houses each year. So not only 
our house price is expensive this year, they're going to keep getting even more expensive. They're going to keep getting even more unaffordable. So we're not even stabilized. We're not even solving the problem. The problem is actively getting worse as we speak. So for young people, that's like a, a nuclear alarm level of, of warning because they're just being priced out of, of being able to afford homes in the places where the jobs are. And so when that happens, people say, well, you're sort of creating a, a two system economy where the people who are already in the city, they can have nice jobs. The people who aren't, you're just saying. Yeah, Alex Petropoulos joining us. The other one I mentioned there was immigration. That's mm -hmm. been a hot button issue on a couple levels. You have some of the channel crossing stuff, which makes big news, but that, you know, that's not changing a lot. That's mm -hmm. something that's kind of always happened. Underneath a lot of this, and we talked about, you know, the political malaise where people get frustrated. The UK hasn't had a lot of extremism in its politics, domestic politics a lot, but you're starting to see some signs of it. And some of it's poking out in this immigration debate, because for the first time in these by-elections, you're starting to see some sectarian voting. You're seeing some nationalism, anti-immigration stuff that's getting kind of ugly. You've got um, things like this that are getting driven. So both sides of the extremist argument feed on crap like this. What can the new government when they get in or Sunak and his, you know, the dying days of his premiership probably ain't going to get a lot done. What does labor need to do to at least feel like there's some stability coming on the immigration stuff just for the, the overall good of the country, number one, and number two, to try to turn down the rhetoric a lot, because that's the kind of stuff that starts really seeping in if there's a feeling that it's out of control and chaotic and it feeds both sides of extremism and then it ends up with a lot of good, innocent people in the middle. So in the short term, the Labour, incoming Labour government actually has is in an OK situation in the sense that they've said publicly we're going to bring immigration down. And, you know, I, I'm a big fan of immigration. And so normally I'd be like, oh, I, I don't really like a party that I'm going to vote for saying this. But in practice, the immigration is already just going to fall. It's going to, to lower by itself as a baseline. We were sort of experiencing an artificial spike of pent up demand that was held up from COVID and held up from from Brexit. And we had a little bit of an artificial spike in immigration. And so immigration numbers will naturally come down. So over that short term, they'll be able to sort of say, look, we're, we're lowering immigration and stopping the channel crossings. That really just involves working with France and sort of negotiating a deal. I see that as being on the table for them since they aren't approaching the problem from a situation where they sort of look at France and go, oh, why don't you do this? You're evil. You're the boogeyman. You're to blame, which is what the current government did. And then France went ahead and said, well, well we're not going to help you. And look how that went. Over a longer time frame, however, immigration has been this thing that has been propping up the UK economy. It's been this thing that's sort of been plugging the holes and a band-aiding over all the weaknesses that may have been present. You have to fix that in, in the long term. You have to either keep immigration up or keep change how immigration happens, or you've got to fix some of those systemic holes. And the fact that the UK economy has still stayed about competitive with its peers, despite all these structural problems, is a sign for optimism. It means that things can get better. But with the removal of this Band-Aid, they, they could also get worse. Alex Petropoulos joining us. Okay, for the outside audience like us in America watching, um, as this campaign goes forward into the general election in July, what's a couple things to watch for? Because again, we expect labor to win and probably win handily, mm -hmm. but there's some underneath stuff here. You know, Starmer spent the last week kind of putting out fires in his own <laughs> in his own labor party over some you know internal beefing. We'll call it that without getting too much in the weeds. I think that's a fair way to describe it. 
success can have its own problems, right? If you know a landslide victory is coming, people start angling for power. They think they're going to get what they want. There's some danger there even in winning. Give us a couple things to kind of be parsing through on the headlines of, yeah, they're winning, they're strong, they're united, they're going to roll into this thing in good shape, or yeah, they won big, but it looks like the ship's a little more rickety than it maybe should be. Give us a couple things to be watching for here. So a few things to look at. One is, like you said, the, the Labour Hub Party has sort of purged the radical left wing. It's sort of homogified the party, and most of the party are Starmer loyalists. Now, what that means is when 400 or so Starmer loyalists all get elected, you're going to have lots of MPs who are loyal, ambitious, and driven to do well. You can't give all of them jobs. You've got too many MPs to give jobs to now. You can't reward that loyalty anymore. So you might start to see some of these ambitious MPs taking pot shots at the government saying, I think I could do this better than you. Because frankly, you've got so many of them that there just aren't enough jobs to go around. So that's one aspect to look at. Another, look at Reform UK. Look at this anti-establishment party. I don't want to say far right because I don't think it's a far right party as much as it's an anti-establishment party that's appeared to the right of the Conservative Party. Look at how well they might do because they will actually look to win some seats. And so that could change the landscape of British politics because that really leads to the last, the third most important thing to look at is look at what the Conservative Party looks like after the election because it's now plausible. I won't say it's likely, but it's plausible that the Conservative Party implodes after the election. They could be heading for numbers that would see them almost split in two, split in between this more moderate centre-right fraction and this more anti-establishment, far-right, far right-leaning, anti-immigration, culture war-esque part of the party. And these two sides of the party absolutely hate each other. They think that the other side of the party is the reason why they're not winning. And if they catastrophically crumble under the, in the election, you could very much see half the party suddenly saying, that's it, I'm going, I'm swapping to reform. The other half of the party saying, we're leaving, we're starting our own new party. And the Conservative Party no longer looking what it looked like. And that's something that David Cameron tried to prevent when he called the Brexit referendum. When he called the Brexit referendum in 2015, 2016, he was trying to unify his party. He was trying to prevent this schism within it between the ones who wanted to leave Europe and the ones who wanted to stay in Europe. And it might be the case that he didn't end up preventing this from happening. He just delayed the inevitable by about nine years. Yeah, Alex Petropoulos, you just brought it up, so let's rehash it, because I mentioned it earlier, but it, it, it's a good. Part of this is how the parliamentary system works in the UK, but Boris Johnson won that massive victory, you know, Red Wall, all that mess, mm -hmm. but it was an artificially big coalition of the party, which was artificial, and there was no way it was going to hold together, and you weren't going to keep that, mm -hmm. and that led directly to the mess we have right now. Labor has a danger of that happening where you get an artificially inflated because, you know, all the things we've already talked about, the inertia, the time, people are getting frustrated, that sort of thing. At the same time that that's happening, you're going to have the Conservative Party and the Tories go into this distilling process where they're going to remake who they are. And with this pressure on their right wing from reform, even if reform doesn't win any seats or only wins one or two, which is probably kind of how it looks, mm. there's going to be that debate of, do we go more to the right to head that off so we're not bleeding people to them, but then we're leaving more door open for labor to pick even more people off and those two things are going to be running parallel at the exact same time in real time. That's really the balance below just, you know, whoever the PM is and, you know, um, prime minister questions and the big shiny stuff. That's mm. really where the action for the next year or two is going to be in UK politics. Is that a fair way to lay it out? That summarizes it really well. Yeah. Who wins? <laughs> like is, is the is the conservatives going to hold it together are they going to go off the rails to the right i mean they got a lot of loud voices that are kind of angling that way can labor hold a coalition together again that'll depend kind of on what the conservatives do and whoever their next leader is do they get somebody charismatic that can stand up to starmer and start pulling votes where do you think this goes after starmer if you know assuming the sky doesn't fall starmer takes the reins here 
come around August? How do you think see this breaking out? I, it almost come. It's very hard to predict because it comes down to it could come down to which conservative MPs actually hold their seats. Because you might get into this position where so many of them lose their seats that there's no longer even a, a sense of like these are the the elite still within the party that that still have a say. And so what you've seen is that the Conservative Party have been selecting some really key core members of of both MPs, but also civil servants, policy directors, strategists, and they've been putting them into these safe seats. Uh, and so this is maybe Conservative HQ, the Conservative Party, already trying to set the foundations for that rebuild, set the foundations for, for what that future could look like. I think that if, if we look at history, when this sort of stuff happens, parties freak out and they shift even further to the right and they secure like a second term for Labour. So I, I could see that very much happening. I think that's pretty much what happened in France with Macron and his party. They secured this massive majority and then the opposition freaked out and moved even further right and they then secured a second massive majority. That being said, maybe there'll be enough voices within the party that say, look, we've got to reclaim the center ground. I think that, to be honest, if there is such a massive, these landslide majorities that we're talking about, the Conservatives can really already write off winning their next election five years later. It, it will be a two-term Labour government. And so there really have to be some, those big, big questions asking themselves, like, we're not even going to win in five years' time. We've really got to just reevaluate and ask ourselves, is this strategy that we're going to now pursue for the next five years sustainable even? Can you play the culture war stuff for five years, not win, and then continue it for another five years. I don't think that's yeah. a sustainable strategy. Yeah, and it's important to note here, traditionally in UK politics, you get that second term for a government. They almost always get at least a second term of government just traditionally, but a lot can happen in five years. Look how much has happened mm -hmm. in the last five years because you know we're five, six years past Brexit now, so who knows? All right, I'm compelled to ask you. I don't really want to. You brought up Reform Party, though, but Nigel Farage is now going to stand for election. Uh, is the eighth time the charge? I know a mutual friend of ours was joking. He's like, I almost hope he gets in parliament because he'll have less time to bug us and we have to write about him because he can do whatever he wants on media right now. But eighth time the charge, do you think he actually has a chance of finally making it in the parliament or is this going to be another um, exercise in failure theater that he'll use to go right back into media? I, I think I think he'll get in, to be honest. I think that he wouldn't... Uh, <sighs> He wouldn't be running if he didn't think he'd get in. He, he's always thought that he's had a chance, but but this time I think will be different. The things are looking, looking so bad for the Tories that he may not have a shot. And I'm almost interested to see what a parliament with that could look could look like. Because you know he will say the things about immigration that I completely disagree with him about. But beyond that, he does also have some interesting views. He's for reforming British politics in general and fixing the voting system away from this fixed first past the post system that would give Labour this massive majority. And so you might even see this weird situation where you have a debate happening in Parliament where the Lib Dems, the sort of these these liberal, the Liberal Party are saying, we think you should fix the voting system, do, do proportional representation. Labour is on the other side saying, no, 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 we need to keep things stable. We need first past the post. And then you've got Nigel Farage somehow on the same side as the Lib Dems. I think that would be amusing, to say the least. It'll be entertaining, if nothing else. Never a dull moment in UK politics. Mm -hmm. Alex Metropolis, love chatting with you. Let folks know where they can keep up with you and what you got going on. We've already talked about a few things. I'm going to have you back on here in a couple of weeks, hopefully. Let folks know I may follow you until we get you back on Hurt Tell again, my friend, whether you're in Brussels or England or wherever you may roam. Uh, Twitter is the place where I'm most of the time. Uh, Twitter.com forward slash Alex T. Pet. Um, yeah, tweeting about politics, tweeting a lot about this election. Honestly, there's never a dull moment. Every day has been a blessing on my timeline with uh, just seeing what they could possibly come up with this time. It, honest, I was so excited for this election, so anticipating it so much, and it has delivered so much more than I could have hoped for in terms of entertainment value. I don't know, man. You haven't even convicted one of your main candidates yet. I mean, you're kind of boring over there. We, uh, we are 100% covering y'all so we don't have to look at our own mess. I'm not even going to pretend we're not. 
<laughs> touche, touche. How much of that's bleeding over? Just out of curiosity, I know I know the the conviction thing because I I was getting media requests from Canada mm-hmm. and the UK on wanting you know do some talking head and when the conviction came down. But how much of that actually broke through the news media over there, especially now that you're in Brussels, which is more mainland Europe. The, yeah. the, the, and for folks that don't know, UK media and European media are two very different beasts, even though they overlap and they watch each other. Um, how, how did it play over there? Yeah, because UK, UK media is almost looking for the American audience, but but it definitely broke through. The conviction really broke through. I was getting messages from my friends. I got I got a message saying like co- convicted with no context. I was like, what? Have, are you arrested? Or, like, <laughs> you can't just send me the message convicted with no context. I don't have news alerts on my phone. I was I was, I was momentarily concerned, but but all my friends were talking about this. All the media was talking about it. It's, it's a big story. But beyond that, I think that the US election has sort of simmered down in UK and, and European media to just being this sort of battle between two old men. We don't know which way it will go. And it's a bit boring and we'd prefer, uh, boring in the sense that we'd prefer if there were some other candidates to talk about, which maybe maybe some parallels between the US narratives as well. Alex Petropoulos, appreciate the conversation, my friend. Always enjoy it. Appreciate your time. Have a good day, sir. Thank you very much. You too. Yes, sir. Welcome back to Hurt Tell. One more thought on this national service as we came off the D-Day remembrance. Uh, Woody Williams died a year or so ago. He was the last Medal of Honor recipient from World War II. He was still alive. He was a West Virginian, uh, somebody I was familiar with. I was really honored. I got to write one of the obituaries for um, uh, Washington Examiner for Woody Williams, a great man. He won the Medal of Honor for his work um, and his duty and the way he fought on uh, Iwo Jima. Uh, he had a flamethrower. <laughs> he literally was in battle with this tank of explosive fuel on his back and fighting. The two men that were assigned to escort him were both killed. He ended up being awarded the Medal of Honor. Woody Williams, though, is fits into this national service debate a little bit in this way. Woody was in his early 20s when Iwo Jima happened. About six hours of that battle is what he's remembered for mostly. But Woody Williams lived to a very old age. Woody Williams was rejected by the Marine Corps and the Army both for being too small. He was only about five foot six. And then as the war drug on, they, you know, they lowered the standards and he got in. They didn't think he was big enough to fight. <laughs> Silly them, right? But the vast majority of Woody Williams' life was not on Iwo Jima. Woody Williams' brother was also in the service, was in uh, Europe and served in Europe, came home a very broken person. We didn't have the knowledge we have now about things like PTSD, physical and emotional wounds that man had, and he died very, very young shortly after the war. This greatly affected Woody Williams, and Woody has talked about the fact that he was a bit of a train wreck himself, personal life, he um, had developed bad habits. He had mental problems from the war that they didn't know how to diagnose at the time, and he was very open about it. And the death of his brother affected him greatly. But he had that moment of realization is like, if I don't change, this is going to happen to me too. He quit drinking. He decided to concentrate on his faith. He was a Christian, whatever your faith is, but he, he was a Christian. He found religion, got his faith together. And then he did what he calls his national service. And that's a term he used, not his stuff as a Marine on Iwo Jima, but for pretty much the rest of his life, he went to work for what we now call Veterans Affairs. He spent years, decades working as an employee, as an advocate. He worked for veterans and veterans services. He was on the front lines of a lot of the change that we saw on how veterans were treated 
um, especially the Vietnam era veterans, because he had the cachet as a Medal of Honor recipient to get attention on things like that. He spent the rest of his life working for veterans and for his country. And then when you talk to him on in interviews and you hear him talk, and when I was researching stuff to write about him, and I'd already read about him, and then when I went to write the obituary and the memorial for him, there was so many quotes of him talking about, this is how I serve. I serve my, I serve my country this way. National service is easy to point to the wartime valor like the D-Day stuff. But the people that survive those and the veterans, they, they live long, long lives. We have 100-year-old veterans today for the 80th anniversary. We have civil servants. And yes, those dreaded bureaucrats, people that spend 30, 40 years working for the government. It's really not fair for us to just say, well, they just did it for the money. Well, of course they did it for the money. You do your job for the money. But they're also still serving our country. We need to understand that things like national service are an all of the above thing, not an and or thing. Your favorite little thing does not a country make. We have a big pluralistic country and it takes a little bit of all these different things to keep it going. There's a lot of ways to have national service. Compulsory, as we've hashed out, isn't the best way. Incentivizing national service is the way to go. And especially as we try to legitimately deal with some really tough issues in a very changing world and in um, America, we talked about the UK a lot today, but let's just go back to America for a minute. In an America that has a lot of real problems and has some structural problems built into our system of government because it's been going for, you know, 200 and almost 50 years now, we've just got some, you know, it's like remodeling a house. There's stuff we got to get cleaned up. There's stuff we've learned. Things have changed. Things need to change. Our country's changing demographically. It's changed economically. Its place in the world's changing. One of the ways to work on all that on a good level, though, is having a good national consciousness of service. But you can't make people have it. You got to incentivize it. And above all else, people have to have a government and a country that they think is worth serving and worth their time to serve. And that takes everybody holding our government accountable, demanding the best of our government, and making sure that we get a government that gives us the things that are worth protecting, defending, spending a lifetime serving. We get the government we deserve. So if you're saying our government doesn't deserve national service, that really starts with us. Once again, like almost all problems in a representative democracy, you don't like how the government looks, start with the mirror. That'll do it for Herd Tell. However, you're listening to the program. We hope you're enjoying it. iTunes, Spotify, however, drop us a line. Love to hear from you. Herd Tell Show, gmail.com, Herd Tell on the Twitter. Until next time, wherever you and yours are, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. And we'll talk to you again soon for more Herd Tell. All the music on Herd Tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. Oh.